Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. For this week's episode of Garden DC, we're talking to David Mizajewski. He's a naturalist, TV host, author, and wildlife expert. And for 20 plus years, he's been with the National Wildlife Federation uh, based in Virginia. And he's also the author of Attracting Birds, Butterflies, and Other Backyard Wildlife to Your Garden. Welcome, David. Hi there. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining me. I know you're going through a little um, household stress right now with plumbing in the background that we might be hearing. Yeah, apologies for that. You know, it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, having gone through my entire front yard dug up last year to replace the, the the water lines there for one tiny leak. I know how that is. Yeah. It is definitely disruptive to your life. So um, you were mentioning before we uh, started recording that you've recently re- relocated. Can you tell our listeners where you're at now? Uh, sure. I'm just outside of the New York City area in New Jersey. Um, as you mentioned at the top, I've been working with the National Wildlife Federation for just over 20 years. And so I've been based in the D.C. area, but um, we recently decided to you know, move up here to the New York City area. My husband works in Manhattan, so it just made a lot of sense. And I do as well for a lot of my media work and was constantly having to travel up here. So just due to the nature of, of you know, the work that I do for the National Wildlife Federation, you know, I am on the road a lot and don't really need to be, you know, in one specific location. So before the pandemic hit, we, you know, I, we made the decision to relocate and I was going to be a remote employee. And now, of course seems like everyone's a remote employee. So, Mm -hmm. And how has the pandemic changed your work schedule? Are you mostly doing um, media uh, interviews over uh, Skype or Zoom, I assume? Yeah, a lot of that. And, and, you know, maybe it's helpful to to take a step back and and just tell listeners exactly what I do for the National Wildlife Federation. Um, I am a naturalist, which, you know, is just somebody who studies the natural world, has a deep knowledge of the natural world and kind of helps interpret it for, you know, the, the average person out there. So they can kind of understand some of the science and the biology that's happening all around us. And of course, when I do my work as a naturalist and kind of communicate about the natural world, you know, my ultimate goal is hopefully to inspire people to want to get involved in the conservation work of the National Wildlife Federation. And so I, you know, most naturalists are working at nature centers or national parks or zoos or places like that, um, museums. I have the kind of cool position to be in that I do a lot of my work as a naturalist in the media. So back in 2004, I wrote a how-to book that you mentioned, Attracting Birds, Butterflies, and Other Backyard Wildlife. It's all about the National Wildlife Federation's Garden for Wildlife program, which I know we're going to dive into. But when that book came out in 2004, the TV network Animal Planet decided to develop it into a makeover show. And the next thing I knew, I went from just being, you know, kind of a science and nature geek to being a TV host. And so I wrote the book, Animal Planet turned it into a series. And the next thing I knew, I was standing in front of the TV cameras. Um, So we did 47 episodes of that series. It was called Backyard Habitat. And we traveled around the country and made over people's, you know, kind of conventional yards, lawns, and non-native plants into something a little more, bit more wildlife friendly. And we certified them as a National Wildlife Federation certified wildlife habitat garden at the end of every episode. And so from there, I kind of launched into doing a lot of media work. So I do all the talk shows. I'm one of the people that brings on all the amazing wildlife ambassadors to all the talk shows. So, uh, you know, you might've seen me on the Today Show or Conan O'Brien or I used to do the Martha Stewart show regularly and many, many, many other shows like that. And, uh, you know, I do a lot of radio, a lot of podcast interviews like this, a lot of, you know, print interviews and that kind of thing. So it's my job, you know, not only to interpret the natural world and inspire people to get involved in conservation, but to do it in the media and particularly entertainment media and really just try to reach as many people as possible with all of these really important messages that the National Wildlife Federation 
is all about. So to answer your question, you know, I, again, can do my work from almost anywhere. Um, again, I, before the pandemic, I was spending a lot of time in New York City, a lot of time in Los Angeles for TV shows and media appearances. A lot of my work is done over the phone or emailing or, again, kind of recording podcasts and that, and that kind of thing. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I'm up here in the New York City area. I grew up in New Jersey, um, so it's kind of a homecoming for me. Most of my family's still here, and it's, it's pretty awesome, other than the plumbing problems we're dealing with right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully they will be over with soon. And for our listeners who aren't familiar with the National Wildlife Federation, they might be familiar with some of the publications like Ranger Rick or Ranger Rick Jr. and yep. the um, flagship publication, National Wildlife. Um, but can you talk about the, the mission a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Well, so the National Wildlife Federation, we're one of the oldest and largest conservation and education organizations in America. We've been around since 1936. And you know, we do focus most of our work here in North America, and that's something that sets us apart from a lot of other conservation organizations that are working on a more global way on, on wildlife conservation. But we, you know, we try to focus on, on North America and, you know, we kind of think of ourselves as America's conservation organization. And so we do that conservation work in a whole wide variety of ways. So, you know, sometimes we're focusing on policy and legislation, you know, we've, you know, in our history, we've were you know important in the fight for the Endangered Species Act and endangered species protections. Currently, we're really um, getting behind something called the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, which is something I hope listeners will check out. It's it's really a piece of legislation that's designed to proactively help declining wildlife before they even get to the point of being endangered. At that point, it's really hard to save them. But if we invest a little bit of you know money that is already kind of you know in in budgets, you know it's a it's a bill that doesn't require any additional, you know, taxes or anything like that. And it's already got a lot of great bipartisan support. And, you know, you can't say a lot of things about that. A lot, a lot, a lot, you can't say that about a lot of things these days, but at any rate, you know, we're, we're working in that way, you know, out of our DC office, but we've got regional offices all around the country. We do a lot of work on saving wi like wildlife habitat, you know, sort of large landscapes, America's great waters. Um, and, at the same time, we also do a lot of work, not necessarily out in the wilderness areas, but in places where people live, in our cities, in our towns, in our neighborhoods. And that's really where our Garden for Wildlife program comes in. And again, we'll talk about that. But the other big thing that we do is we're really committed and always have been to getting people connected or reconnected to nature, kids in particular. And so you mentioned Ranger Rick Magazine. You know, we started publishing Ranger Rick Magazine in the 50s. And again, it's all about educating kids, but also kind of inspiring them to want to go out and into the outdoors and experience nature on their own. And we've got a whole host of programs really targeted at, at, at kids and youth, everything from formal education programs like Eco Schools USA and Schoolyard Habitats. Uh, we have a, a program that's uh, all about early childhood in the outdoors, our ECHO program, looking at pre-K, all the way up to you know our, our campus work. So, um, And then we have informal events and family things like our Great American Camp Out that, again, are designed just to inspire people and give them a fun way to get out into the outdoors, whether it's going off into the wilderness or just going out in their own backyard. Wow, that is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. And I only barely scratched the surface. I really do encourage folks, um, just head to our website. It's nwf.org. And you can learn a lot more about us. One other thing I, I, I want to mention is that, you know, our name is Federation, National Wildlife Federation. And, you know, our roots really are in that idea. And we are a true federation. So back in 1936, um, a political cartoonist named Ding Darling um, basically founded the National Wildlife Federation. We had the he, he called together this big convention of all sorts of different kinds of people who all had a shared value of the importance of wildlife and our natural heritage in America. And so from the very get-go, we were this, this federation, this big coalition. Um, and out of that meeting, is the National Wildlife Federation was formed. So, you know, uh, everybody from hunters and anglers to bird watchers to hikers, you know, were all at that meeting. And that remains true today. You know, the National Wildlife Federation really does bring in you know, people from all walks of life, from all political spectrums, and, you know, and really tries to focus on what unites us. And that is, again, our love of wildlife. And, you know, together, 
we can really, you know, add our voices and become a real powerful voice for wildlife. So we're a national organization. I mentioned we've got uh, regional offices around the country, but we also federate together with a state affiliate in every state and territory. And these are separate conservation organizations that, again, we all kind of pull our voices together for wildlife. And just like in the beginning, you know, we've got some traditional hunting and angling affiliates. We've got some, you know, super progressive climate change and energy focused uh, affiliates. But again, we all focus on that shared value and it's a pretty powerful thing. So a little bit about the background of the National Wildlife Federation there. Yeah, and I can imagine all those diverse groups and voices coming together uh, are very powerful with legislators because they're all coming together for one issue, even though all their little concerns um, or individual concerns would be obviously maybe even at each other's um, adversarial uh, at, in some aspects. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, you know, it's not always easy, right? I mean, when you bring people from from different perspectives together, um, and you know, it certainly comes with its own set of challenges. But at the end of the day, that's how we're going to save wildlife. You know, wildlife conservation is is not a partisan issue, or it shouldn't be. Um, and saving our natural resources, you know, having clean air and clean water, fighting climate change. You know, I mean, it's been made political, but Climate change affects us all. It doesn't matter what party you, you belong to. And so if we can focus again on that shared value of the importance of having healthy wildlife populations in this rapidly changing world, that's actually our mission to unite all Americans to ensure that wildlife thrive in a rapidly changing world. You know, when we can come together and unify and focus on that shared value, we really can make a difference. Hmm. And you had mentioned um, some of the outreach program for children, and I vividly remember poring over issues of Ranger Rick as a child, and especially because I have a fondness of raccoons and think they're (laughs) (laughs) some of the cutest wild, just adore them um, and their cat-like behavior. But um, in this day and age, um, how do you reach out to children who might not be familiar with backyard wildlife? Maybe they're growing up in an apartment and not having access to local parks. Yeah, so that's such a critically important question, right? And so it's funny, you know, that we, it's funny you bring it up because just the terminology, right? Backyard habitat. And in fact, that, that used to be the name of our what we now call our Garden for Wildlife movement. You know, back in 1973, we founded this this program that was all about inspiring people to make their own piece of the earth a little bit better for the local wildlife and kind of reconnect our cities, our towns, our neighborhoods, you know, back into the local ecosystem instead of having them be these kind of broken off pieces that didn't really support any anything else other than humans and maybe rats and pigeons. And so... Um, we called it backyard habitat, and you know when, a- after years of getting the question or, or or getting the comment like, oh, I've you know I've got a great butterfly garden, but it's in my front yard, so it doesn't count, you know, because people were just taking that term so literally, <laughs> yeah. and then also getting to your question is this idea that you you know you have to have a suburban backyard in order to help wildlife locally, and that's just not true, and it never has been, and our message has always been that it doesn't matter where you live, how much space you have, or even if you have, you know, sort of your own outdoor space, or, you know, you're, you're getting involved in a local community garden, or, you know, planting things for pollinators and other wildlife in containers on a balcony or a deck or a a city, uh, you know, rooftop or something like that. It doesn't matter. If you can plant things, you can be helping to support wildlife populations. And so that's why probably about a decade or so ago, We kind of shifted the name of the program from the Backyard Wildlife Habitat Program, which again, kind of just connotes immediately suburban, to the Garden for Wildlife Program. And so it's shifting away from the place and really focusing more on the the action, the action that we want people to do. And so, you know, there's many, again, you can do this anywhere, right? You can, like I said, you can plant a pollinator garden in containers. You can plant trees and shrubs in containers, even if you live in urban areas. Uh, I mentioned community gardens. There's a tremendous network of community gardens and all across this country that are great opportunities to get involved and, and again, make your community 
wildlife friendly, even if it's not something that is on your own personal property. Um, there's plenty of green spaces and green infrastructure that could be enhanced by additional wildlife habitat, landscaping, and gardening, even in the densest cities. You know, New York City, for example, you know, it's the height of, 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 of urbanism, but there are green networks within it. And, you know, many of them are being designed now with the needs of songbirds and bees and other pollinators in mind. And so you really, that's the big message I want folks to, to walk away with that, you know, it doesn't matter, again, where you live, how much space you have. If you can plant something, that's where it all starts. And we can dive into that a little bit more about why planting is so important for wildlife. But that's kind of a little bit of the philosophy behind, again, what we used to call the Backyard Habitat Program, now Garden for Wildlife. Mm -hmm. And great points about um, New York City and the recent introductions of the High Line and some of the pier landscapes that they're building out um, yeah. really demonstrate you know, almost overnight how wildlife comes automatically. Like, you know, well, if you plant it, they will come. You took my line. <laughs> that's what I was just going to say. Um, yeah, you know, it's true. This stuff works. And that's one of the most powerful things about the idea of gardening for wildlife, because I can guarantee you, if you do it, you will be rewarded by seeing these animals that you're trying to support, you know, and, and I, little aside, let's talk a little bit about what we mean by wildlife. You know, a lot of times people hear wildlife and they automatically think of bears and wolves and mountain lions and moose and, you know, whatever. Um, obviously, that's not the kind of wildlife we're talking about in this context, right? So this is not a program that, you know, we're, we're trying to get people to lure in big predators. What it's focusing on are those species, and there are many of them, that can safely coexist right alongside us if we just give them a little bit of habitat. So I'm talking about the the, the songbirds um, and the hummingbirds, and I'm talking about the butterflies and the moths and the bees. I'm talking about small reptiles and amphibians like box turtles and tree frogs and toads that, again, they, they're great neighbors to have around. You know, and you know, medium-sized mammals, you know, the urban mammals, that uh, urban suburban mammals, you know, red foxes, gray foxes, you know, possums, which are just fantastic animals. Um, these are all the kinds of animals that can actually be supported in what we call a wildlife habitat garden. And I really want to emphasize that insects are wildlife, right? We tend to not think of them as such, but they are, they're animals. You know, they're not mammals, they're not furry, they're not birds or feathered. That's kind of, again, where our brain tends to go when you say animal or wildlife, but insects are wildlife and they happen to be incredibly important wildlife. They're at the base of the food web. They're pollinators. Um, you know, they're seed dispersers. And so without a healthy insect population, the whole ecosystem really declines. And so when you create a wildlife habitat garden, yes, you are going to see beautiful songbirds and hummingbirds and, you know, big showy butterflies, but you're also going to be supporting a whole host of other invertebrates you know, insects and spiders and things like that, that are really the fuel on which everything else is kind of running. Mm -hmm. And do you encounter people who are like, that's one type of wildlife I don't want. Maybe they have a issue with spiders or yep. um, other creatures. Yeah, absolutely. And like I was just saying, you know, we're not in, in encouraging people to try to draw in you know, problematic wildlife or wildlife that can be dangerous, right? So, and that's an important message here too. Part of our program is about teaching people not just how to attract wildlife, but also how to avoid conflicts with wildlife. And so it's absolutely fine, you know, if you want to focus on on pollinators and, you, you know, you plant a bee garden or a butterfly garden and, you know, you want to put up a fence to keep the deer out from devouring it, right? Um, you know, we talked about raccoons a minute ago and certainly raccoons, you know, they can get themselves into a little bit of trouble in our yards mm -hmm. and gardens, you know. And so uh, if you if you want to, you know, try to deter certain kinds of animals, I think that's totally fine to do as long as, you know, again, in the big picture, you're providing habitat for something. And so and a note on that, too, with with animals like raccoons, you know, usually in almost all cases, these kinds of wildlife conflicts can be solved with just simple behavior changes on our part. So, you know, you have raccoons knocking over your trash cans. Well, get a trash can with a lid that snaps or bolts on, right? Or get heavy-duty bungee cords. That's what we do here because we did have a raccoon checking out our trash cans. 
um, you know, and, and, and problem solved, you know, critter proof your house. You should be doing that anyway, even if you're not creating a wildlife garden. Check and make sure that your roof line is secure and that, you know, your foundation doesn't have gaps where animals can get in to live under there. You know, if you have your windows open, make sure you put screens in them. That'll keep bugs and birds and bats from getting into your house. You know, just simple things like that, that we all should be doing. And you pretty much can avoid most of those kinds of, of, of potential conflicts with most wildlife species. So, you know, the other group of wildlife that people tend to have that kind of, oh, I don't want that um, reaction are snakes. And I want to say this pretty, you know, clearly, almost all snake species are 100% harmless to people. And all snake species are beneficial to people. So while, you know, our culture has developed this kind of knee-jerk terror reaction to snakes, it's really not based on any kind of reality. Certainly there are some venomous species of snakes that can be potentially dangerous, but Honestly, for the most part, they're they're not really that commonly found showing up in people's yards and gardens. You know, it depends on what part of the country you're in. You know, if you're out west in the deserts, you know, yes, there are rattlesnakes and things like that. But the message there is, you know, not to have a scorched earth point of view and to wipe out all the habitat. The message is start by educating yourself. Learn what species of snakes might be living around you and which ones, you know, could be potentially harm harmful. Um, or dangerous to people or pets, and learn to identify them. It's not hard. You know, there's many great field guides, and I'll give a shout out, a little plug for a project that I worked on this year that I'm really excited about. The National Wildlife Federation just launched a whole series of of, of field guides that were called our Nature Guide apps, um, and they're digital, so you can take them with you wherever you go. And we've got a whole series of them, you know, birds and insects and um, reptiles and amphibians, and their search functions are really powerful. You know, you can really kind of hone in on what species are around you and you can see photos and ID. You know, just if you're worried about that kind of thing, just do a little bit of reading and and learn to identify what potentially, you know, harmful snakes there are so that if you see the non-harmful or the non-dangerous or non-venomous kinds, um, you know, you don't have to freak out and you don't have to panic and God forbid, you know, you don't have to have the knee-jerk reaction of getting a shovel and bashing it. You know, that's what people do. And it's just terrible. You know, I mean, I hear people still today in 2020 say, the only good snake is a dead snake. And, you know, just, I, I wish people wouldn't say that. Frankly, it's an ignorant thing to say. And snakes are important. They're food for lots of other wildlife. Um, you know, birds of prey, songbirds sometimes will eat small snakes. Um, and they themselves are beneficial in that, most backyard snake species are doing things like eating rodents and eating insects and things like that that have a huge beneficial impact on us. So while there are some animals that, you know, aren't really kind of part of what you would say, what, what you would call, you know, backyard wildlife or wildlife that you want to attract, there's a lot of other species that people have a fear-based knee-jerk reaction to that they probably shouldn't. And that's, again, one of our goals with the Garden for Wildlife program is to help people understand this stuff so that we can live a little bit more harmoniously with our wild neighbors. Hmm. Yeah. And I think education and obviously exposure to those animals helps a great deal um, to quell a lot of those fears. I think the coolest thing I found in my garden in the last few years was a, the skin of a black rat snake that had been shed and left in my perennial uh, beds and I never, I never did see the snake. He he was, I guess, passing on through, <laughs> but at least I had some evidence of him. Right. And, and that's also a good point. Oftentimes these animals might be present and you'll never see them, you know? So it's not something that should keep you up at night. And um, yeah. And, and the, another point I want to make about that too, is that when it comes to helping us as a society kind of look at wildlife from a more realistic point of view and not just based on fear is that kids are not born with a lot of these fears. You know, kids are drawn to, to animals, whether they're furry and cute or they're creepy and crawly. Right. And we adults teach children either directly, but even more so indirectly based on how we respond. And what we say. So if you see a snake and you say, ew, well, the kids around you are going to hear that. They're going to absorb that. And little girls in particular 
are not grossed out by these things. You know, the snakes and tails and puppy dog, snakes and snails and puppy dog tails, that old rhyme, you know, that's frankly hogwash, right? You know, little girls are just as drawn to the, these things as little boys, but we teach them from a very young age. Oh, that's not for you. That's for, that's for boys, you know? And then we wonder why there's such issues with, you know, STEM education and getting girls involved in math and sciences, right? Well, guess why? Because you taught them that that wasn't for them. And that's a crime. So just keep in mind how you react if there's kids in your life, particularly girls that, you know, they don't, you know, you can be having a negative impact on them, not in addition to the wildlife based on your fear-based reactions. Mm -hmm. And speaking of kids, um, let's talk about your childhood and, and what brought you to be a naturalist. Yeah. So as I mentioned, I grew up here in New Jersey, um, in the you know suburbs, about an hour outside of New York City. And, you know, there's plenty of nature in New Jersey, despite what people like to say about our state. And so I was really blessed in that I spent my childhood living just kind of in a typical suburban development that, you know, had some woods and some fields around. There was a creek that ran through not too far from my backyard. And I got to just explore nature. As a kid, you know, I ran around in the woods with my friends. I climbed trees. I turned over rocks and, you know, caught snakes and things like that. Uh, my poor parents, I was constantly bringing critters home in my pockets, you know, which I don't necessarily recommend that people do steal wildlife out of the wild. But, you know, a lot of us grew up doing that. And it was it was an important part of our discovery of nature. So, you know, and, and that's something that, you know, I, I feel like I probably was the last generation that got to do that. I grew up in the eighties and in the last, you know, 20, 30 years, we've really seen this disturbing trend of the indoor child. Um, and this idea of nature deficit disorder, this idea that children are having such a disconnection from nature that it's actually causing a lot of problems. And there is a whole body of research looking into this, you know, showing that kids that get to go outside, in particular, when they get to go outside and explore on their own terms, you know, so, so sort of unstructured time, so not just playing sports, you know, kids that get to do that tend to be more physically fit. They have less chance of having vitamin D deficiencies, less chance of being nearsighted. They tend to have more curiosity and creativity. Oftentimes, they're better behaved in the classroom setting. So there's this whole host of kind of like, health benefits that go along with kids getting to explore nature. And of course, we know that kids that get to experience nature as, as kids, you know, they grow up with a sense of understanding it and less fear of it. And obviously that's important because they grow up into adults that understand why it's important to have, you know, wildlife and, and clean air and clean water. Right. And so a lot of, again, the National Wildlife Federation's work and programs is, has always been focused on, helping create those kinds of experiences for kids and reaching parents. So, you know, we've got a great program called Green Hour that's kind of based on all this research and the idea that, you know, you don't have to be a, an expert, you know, to give your kids nature experiences. Just make it a priority to get outdoors with your kids and let them roam around a little bit. And, you know, dirt is okay. You know, scrape knee here and there is okay. Um, and so, you know, that's the kind of thing, again, that's happening less and less these days, and it really needs to be happening more and more. Especially during these times um, right. of the pandemic and being stuck inside for so many hours just Absolutely, to be able to get yeah. out there and run around. Yeah. And, and to, to finish answering your, your question, actually, because you asked mm -hmm. about my childhood, is that, again, I got to grow up that way. And I can have to say, like, how the older I get, the more... I realize how important that was and the more grateful I am to my parents for letting my sisters and me kind of just, you know, I mean, they weren't like shipping us off into the wilderness for a week on, on end, right? Like we'd spend the afternoon running around in the woods and we would come home for dinner, you know? And so, um, but it really was so important as a foundation. You know, I, I, I kind of joke and I always say when people ask, oh, how did you get into, you know, all this nature and, and wildlife stuff. And I say I was born this way. And I really do think I was I'm just innately drawn to other species in the natural world. But if I didn't have the opportunity as a kid to, again, experience and explore nature, I don't know if I'd be here today. You know, maybe I would do would have done something different with my life in terms of a career. So that experience was really, really foundational. And of course, you know, I went on to be a junior naturalist at my local nature center and 
studied ecology in college, which is what my degree is in, along with political science, if you can believe that. And, um, you know, I'm a lifelong nature geek, and I really do credit the experience of getting to grow up with access to nature that as a big part of what got me to here, you know, here where I am today. So you sound like my brother who would bring home every creature <laughs> that he found yeah. and would, would fill up uh, his bedroom if he could, um, if everything. Do you have any pets in your household now? I do. I've got a cute dog and I've got a betta fish. And for right now, that's, that's, you know, that's what I have. But, you know, once we, I've only been in this new house for about five months. So, you know, we might expand the menagerie now that we're, you know, once we're fully settled in here. And you know, I went from a uh, living in, you know, in, in DC and, you know, row house home. So not particularly huge. And, um, you know, we're in the, the suburbs of New York City now. So we've got a little bit more space to work with. So, yeah, right now, honestly, what I have been really focusing on is indoor gardening. Um, and I've got a great room, a little extra room that used to be a, a, a semi-enclosed porch that has been, you know, by previous owners enclosed. So it's got a couple great windows, but it's got a concrete floor. And I have converted that into my plant room. Um, and so I, every morning, get up, I, in these times of pandemic, like many other people, I feed my sourdough starter and then I putter around in my plant room while I have my coffee and just, you know, mist, check for pests, prune, smell the flowers, and then I get my day started. So uh, I've been focus focusing a little bit more on my indoor plants than, you know, building a, a, an indoor menagerie. But, you know, I probably am going to set up some terrariums and maybe get, you know, some tree frogs or something like that. They'll actually work perfectly in that in that plant room. Hmm. Yeah, and we can call ourselves plant parents. That's right. Um, <laughs> and um, so getting back out into the backyard habitat and garden, um, what are the elements that a homeowner should be adding to attract wildlife? Yeah, so I mentioned a minute ago that this idea of, of planting is, is really critical for wildlife. And the idea of gardening you know, and, and that's why we call the program Garden for Wildlife. But a lot of times there's a little bit of a disconnect where people think, well, don't I not want wildlife in the garden? Aren't they going to destroy my garden? Because that's how we have been taught. But the reality is, is that it's actually the opposite. And, and here's why. So, so plants, again, are at the very foundation of the food web and the very foundation of the ecosystem and the habitat that wildlife need to survive. So wildlife habitat starts with plants and you know they provide habitat elements in a whole bunch of different ways and they also then like i said they're kind of the base of that food web so after the plants the first layer of animal life really are those invertebrates the insects and the spiders and the worms and whatnot and those then become a really important food source for the next layer up and and you know the research has shown that something like 90 plus percent of all the insects out there that rely on plants to complete part of their life cycle, either as food or host plant or whatever, they can only survive on plants that they share an evolutionary history with, that they co-evolved with over you know, hundreds of thousands of years here in, in their native habitat. And so the idea here is that what you want to be doing is planting native plants. Now, I'm pretty sure your listeners are familiar with native plants, but if not, you know, a native plant really at its most basic level is just a plant species that evolved in your region. And North America has, you know, a few do dozen eco regions and, you know, each one of them has slightly different conditions. So therefore the plant palette is maybe a little bit different. Obviously there's overlap in, in adjacent eco regions, but, you know, the idea is just, you know, plant the things that, that evolved here and that is what the wildlife need to survive. And one of the reasons why we are seeing such a dramatic loss of wildlife. And, you know, we didn't talk about this yet, but, you know, you look, you look at the monarch butterfly population, which is completely plummeting. The north, the eastern population, east of the Rockies, you know, it varies from year to year, but it's gone down by as much as 90% in just the last 20 years. The western population, west of the Rockies, the last several years, they, they're down to less than 1% left of the western monarch butterfly population. Um, last year, we heard the big new uh, report on, on the bird population in North America. Almost a third of the bird population 
has disappeared since 1970 in North America. There's about 3 billion less birds here today than there were back in 1970. You know, these things are affected by a whole bunch of different factors, general habitat loss and climate change and, and those kinds of things. But a big piece of that puzzle is the sprawling development of, of humans, right? Whether it's converting, you know, into really heavily you know, sort of urbanized areas or converting natural habitat to agriculture, huge factory farm fields, or converting it into suburban areas where we take the native plant community and we wipe it out and then we replace it with asphalt and lawns and non-native plants that literally support nothing. Like you might as well plant plastic plants when it comes to creating wildlife habitat if all you're planting is a lawn and a few ornamental trees and shrubs, right? They don't really support anything because they don't have those evolutionary connections the way that the native plants do. So at the end of the day, what this is all about is trying to encourage and empower and educate and inspire people to plant more natives. And the definition of gardening is planting something with a purpose, right? So if you plant vegetables because you like to eat them, you're a vegetable gardener. Well, if you plant native plants because you want to support and attract the birds and the bees and the butterflies and the other wildlife, then that makes you a wildlife gardener. And so that's kind of the core concept of what this is all about. Now, if you want to break down it one step further, there's really four things that all wildlife need to survive. And these are the things that we look at when we try to assess whether or not a landscape or a garden, you know, kind of is good for wildlife. And those four things are food, water, cover, and places to raise young. And the cool thing is, is that your plants are going to provide three of those four elements. You know, water is probably something you'll have to add in the form of a bird bath or maybe a, you know, a small garden pond or something like that. But, you know, food plants are, are like I said a couple times, the foundation of the food web. So they're either feeding wildlife directly by forming seeds or nuts or berries uh, or, you know, forming cones or producing nectar and pollen, which are food sources, sap. And in some cases, yeah, the foliage, right? Those That becomes food. And then those plants support the insects, which then, again, are that next layer up. And, you know, let's look at songbirds or backyard birds in general. 96% of upland terrestrial birds, so, you know, all the birds that you might want to attract into your backyard, you know, not counting seabirds, I guess, they feed their babies pretty much an exclusive diet of insects. So if you, you know, if you don't have native plants and you're not going to have insects and the birds will have nothing to feed their babies, you know? And so again, you look at the, the fact that there's more lawn in North America than any other irrigated crop. Yeah. You know, there's some 40 million acres of lawn, which is not supporting any insect life. Right. But if you, and, and then we wonder why the bird population is disappearing. So if you plant natives, that they, they will support those insects, which are important wildlife in and of themselves, and the birds will be able to feed their babies. They'll have that habitat component. So food is really important, directly from the native plants or by the smaller wildlife that the native plants support. Cover is really all about giving animals places to hide. You know, if they're prey species, places to hide out so predators can't get them. And if they're predators, places to hide so they can actually catch a meal. It also has to do with the weather. You know, when the weather gets really cold or wet or rainy or hot, animals want to seek shelter somewhere. And they oftentimes will find that cover resources in all of those instances within the plants. And with cover, it's, you know, it's about planting densely and mimicking the communities of plants that Mother Nature does. So in other words, not just, you know, kind of a flat lawn with one shrub stuck in front of it, you know, maybe a shrub row you know, or maybe a big canopy tree underplanted with an understory tree. And so you kind of get, you know, you increase the cover value. And then that, that last habitat component is places to raise young. And this is really about making sure that wildlife have the resources that they need to complete their life cycle. And sometimes animals have different needs in their juvenile phase versus their adult phase. So again, think of butterflies. They start out life as caterpillars and have a very different habitat requirement than the adult form does. Same with amphibians. They start out life as aquatic tadpoles or, or larvae that breathe through gills, and then eventually they grow lungs and legs and come out of the water. So, um, But again, your plants are going to be the main way that you provide places to raise young. Where do birds nest? In trees and shrubs. So plant trees and shrubs, and you've met that requirement. 
where do butterflies lay their eggs? Well, they lay them on their species caterpillar host plants. You know, every butterfly and moth has slightly different, you know, they have a limited number of plants that their caterpillars can feed on, that they've co-evolved with to be immune to that plant's chemical defenses. And so without those specific host plants, butterflies can't finish their life cycle and their numbers go down. That's a big part of what we're seeing with the monarch butterfly and why their numbers are plummeting. So again, it all goes back to providing these natural sources of food and cover and places to raise young with your plant material. And again, that's why this is a garden program. Now you can supplement the natural habitat. If you want to put out a few bird feeders, no problem with that. Just keep them clean. They can spread disease if you don't. Um, and don't overdo it. Don't have like 50 feeders on a small little piece of property. And just remember that feeders are not habitat. Feeders are a supplement. And wild birds use them that way. Birds only use feeders as a supplement to the natural foods they're finding in the landscape. And only a handful of bird species will actually ever use a feeder. So focus on feeding by planting a good diverse native plant community. Again, that provides the seeds and the berries and the nuts and the fruit and the nectar um, and the insects for the birds, and they'll have everything they need. Um, you can put up a nesting box for cavity nesting birds. That's fine to do, or a bat house, um, things like that. And then again, you know, putting out a bird bath or a garden pond will provide a water resource. So those are the things. It's starting focusing on native plants that are going to provide natural sources of food and cover and places to raise young at a water source. And then the last thing is what we call sustainable gardening. And really, this is just the idea that when we garden, you know, you can do it in a more or less environmentally friendly way. So, you know, if you create, if you plant natives and you provide all this habitat, this food and places to raise young and everything, but then you spray pesticides everywhere, you know, it kind of defeats the purpose. So sustainable gardening includes things like not spraying pesticides in your yard, things like practicing water conservation, you know, get a rain barrel, collect rainwater, use that instead of the municipal water resources. You know, saving water is an important thing. Um, keeping your cat indoors, you know, keeping control of our, our domesticated animals, which take a huge toll on wildlife. Um, you know, cats take out anywhere from like one to over four billion birds every year unnaturally out of the, the their natural habitat. But, you know, they kill them. And it's not the cat's fault. You know, they're just doing what instinct dictates to them. But there's so many more domesticated cats than would ever be present in terms of wild native predators. And it's a huge negative impact. They also take out about 20 billion small mammals and no one has even studied their impact on insects or reptiles or amphibians. And by the way, indoor cats live much longer, healthier lives, like twice as long of a lifespan than a cat that goes outdoors. So it's better for your cat too. But anyway, things like that, reducing the size of your lawn, uh, those all fall under the category of what we call sustainable gardening. So if you provide, if you use native plants and then provide food, water, cover, places to raise young and maintain your garden naturally and sustainably, those are the things that we look for when we are going to certify a property or recognize a, a property or a garden space as what we call a certified wildlife habitat. And I was going to ask for maybe some specific plant choices for uh, perhaps somebody in a urban or um, close in suburban situation in the DC area. Yeah. I mean, it's depending on, you know, where you live, right. Or all across the country, it's going to be different, but for the mid Atlantic region, um, I mean, any, really any native perennial wildflower is something that you can grow in containers. If, you know, you're living in uh, one of the many kind of, you know, uh, uh, row house type homes or, um, you know, sort of uh, townhouse communities, that kind of thing that are super, super prevalent in the D.C. region. Um, you know, if you're in a more suburban area, you can plant those same things in the ground and, you know, trees and shrubs. So, you know, I always recommend shrubs as a really good place to start. And it's for a couple of reasons. Number one, shrubs are, they don't get as big as trees. You know, and a shrub is a woody plant. You know, it's got a woody stem with bark that, um, you know, persists above the ground throughout the year. It doesn't die back to the ground the way a perennial herbaceous plant would. And, um, you know, shrubs come in a wide variety of sizes, but they're not generally going to get more than, you know, for some, you know, a big shrub species, 10 or 12 feet, but there are many that stay much smaller. So they're really good for the scale of what most people's yards or gardens are like. And because they are a woody plant, they're providing habitat value pretty much year round. 
And if you get a good kind of mix of different shrub species, you can be providing habitat in the form, again, of, of maybe nectar in the spring for hummingbirds and for, for early, uh, early active bees that then once those pollinators pollinate the shrub flower, those shrubs start putting out berries that the birds eat in the, in the summer and the fall. And the birds are going to find shelter and cover there, maybe even nest in them. So shrubs are kind of like the real workhorses, I think, of a wildlife habitat garden. And, you know, again, if you get smaller species or really big containers, if you're living on the more urban side of things, you can certainly plant some some of those in, in pots. You know, and in fact, in my old D.C. row house backyard, which was very narrow, um, and I think the garden area, you know, I had a patio there. Um, the garden area was only something like, I think it was about 13 feet long by roughly six feet wide, but I had over almost two dozen species of native plants, mostly perennials, but I did have some shrubs. Um, and I even had things in big containers on the patio. So, um, so things like some of my favorites, um, shrubs include, um, the, the chokeberries and and the viburnums, the native viburnums, blueberries are really great. Elderberry is really great. You notice a lot of these are, are burying shrubs. Um, you know what you plant where is gonna is gonna kind of dictate well like what your local what your conditions are in your specific yard or garden space will dictate you know what you want to plant. So you know arrowwood viburnum, maple leaf viburnum. These are two native shrubs. They tend to be woodland plants, so they're more of like a you know, part sun shade kind of thing, but other things are going to want more full sun. You know, some things are going to want wet soil. Some things are going to want dry soil. So, you know, it's, it's really your specific to your site. And yeah, you might have to do a little bit of reading and a little bit of research, ask at your local nursery, that kind of thing. And you want to get the right plant in the right place. Cause you know, again, even if a plant's native, if you plant it in conditions that are not where it's going to thrive, it's not going to live. Some other great examples that I can think of are New Jersey tea is one of my favorites. This is a low growing shrub that will actually kind of spread and naturalize a little bit. And um, it only gets to be two, maybe three feet tall. It's got a really, uh, you know, kind of nice little white flower on it and the pollinators love it. It's a caterpillar host plant for a few different species of butterflies and moths. So that's a really good one if you, you know, again, especially for a smaller space that tends to like a more full sun condition. Another one of my favorite shrubs is button bush. These are really fun. They naturally grow in wetland areas, but they'll do fine in like a regular garden soil if you don't have like a, a wet spot to plant them. But they get these glo like globe shaped flowers that are just really fun and funky looking. Um, and again, I mentioned elderberry. In a lot of these plants, we can eat too, you know, so plant a bunch of them and, you know, that way you'll get some berries, the birds will get some berries. So anyway, those are just some examples. I can also say um, oak trees we know are really, really great habitat trees. So number one, they provide acorns, which are a food source for mammals and birds. They also, what most people don't know, are really fantastic pollinator plants. So they don't provide nectar or pollen for pollinators, but what they do provide is a place to raise young for many species of butterflies and moths. The, the genus Quercus, the oak genus, collectively serves as the caterpillar host plant for 557 species of butterflies and moths. So, you know, plant an oak tree and you'll be providing a ton of habitat, not just for the birds, but also for the butterflies as well. So, um, and then again, wildflowers, native perennials, things like purple coneflower are great. Cardinal flower is beautiful and attracts hummingbirds, um, likes wet soils, uh, black-eyed Susans. One of my favorites is um, Anis hyssop um, or giant hyssop, uh, Agastache, is a really, really fantastic plant. Very, very attractive to pollinators. Mountain mint is another one. I'm going to stop there because you can tell I'll keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say all of those I'm proud to say I have in my garden and I am a, a certified wildlife habitat garden awesome. and have my plaque proudly displayed. One um, shrub that I can really attest to that's popular with wildlife is calicarpa or beautyberry because uh -huh. I have it planted right next to my little backyard pond on a very urban corner and it has already been stripped of all its berries. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> one of my like, favorites too. 
Yeah, it's so beautiful. I have and, to check because I'm not sure if it, if it's native this far north, but that is one that if it is, is definitely going to be on my list, but I cut you off. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, I was just going to say there are some new cultivars that um, make it a little smaller and easier, say, if you have a really small um, urban uh, front yard or backyard to put it in or in a container. Same thing with the um, button bush mm-hmm. that you had mentioned, which I adore. They They just introduced a new um dwarf cultivar and dwarf being relative so (laughs) instead of getting like six foot by six foot it might be more like three to four foot right right um oh shoot i just thought of another one that i was gonna oh i I remember itia virginia Mm. sweet fire is another really good one and all of these i'll mention are things that are, are cultivated so they're things that are available if you go to the garden center and so um, the D.C. area actually has some some pretty cool native plant nurseries that you can check out. Um, you can Google them. You know, there's one in Alexandria, Virginia. There's one in Arlington. Um, but even the big nurseries often have a good native plant selection. And this is another message, too, is that if you're not uh, if you're not sure what species are native and you go to your garden center and you ask and they kind of look at you like, you know, they don't know what you're talking about. Use your voice as a consumer to help drive the market. You know, those of us who work on the conservation side, you know, we're, we're, we've made a really big headway in the last couple of decades working with the garden and horticulture industry to really try to encourage them to grow more native plants. But, you know, they're businesses and they need to make, sell things that people are going to buy. So if you as a consumer are vocal, and tell the nurseries, the retailers, they're going to go back to their growers and say, hey, we're hearing a lot of demand for native plants. And we're hearing a lot of demand for plants that are that are available that are have not been treated with pesticides, you know, things like that. So everybody as a consumer has a real tremendous power to help drive the market. But you have to speak up. You have to ask for these things. Otherwise, the industry isn't going to provide them. Very true. And I'm happy to see um, in the last few years that independent garden centers are doing a great job making um, tagging available that notes what's a native, what might be a native var, a native cultivar, yeah. and even um, putting together like little vignettes of this would be a sample of a, a native wildlife um, bed that you could create and putting it together like a display for the, for the consumer. Yeah, yeah. So um, a couple resources that I'll mention. Number one, the National Wildlife Federation has worked with Dr. Doug Tallamy, which I'm sure many of your listeners um, are familiar with. Doug is the entomologist from the University of Delaware, who has done a lot of really great research looking at the impact of native plants in the landscape on insect populations and therefore birds. And a lot of the stats that I've quoted to you today come out of his research. But um, he created this list for the Mid-Atlantic where it basically was a ranked list of the best plants that to serve as caterpillar host plants in ranked order. And that's where the oak, the oak numbers that I was just sharing with you come from. But uh, we worked with him to, to build out that list for the entire country. So we have a tool on our website that's called the Native Plant Finder. And if you Google Native Plant Finder, it should be the first thing that comes up where no matter where you live, you can put in your zip code and you'll get a list out of based on on Dr. Tallamy's work of the top ranked woody plants and herbaceous plants that are going to serve as caterpillar host plants and then therefore serve as bird plants because the birds are going to eat a lot of those caterpillars and feed their babies them. So that's there. Um, and if you go, the website is, by the way, nwf.org slash garden. That'll take you to our garden for wildlife section. And you'll see the native plant finder right there. But um, yeah, I mean, we've had a long relationship with American Beauty's Native Plants. This is a branded line of native plants that we kind of helped launch about almost 20 years ago. And, um, you know, we're still, we still work closely with the, with the, the team that creates those plants. And um, again, I mentioned some of the other uh, native plant nurseries and things like that. Earth Sangha and uh, uh, Nature by Design um, in Alexandria are two ones that, um, that are really great. And I want to talk a little bit, since you brought it up, about cultivars or nativars. Mm-hmm. So a cultivar, of course, is a cultivated variety of a plant, and many of the native plants that are on the market are cultivars. And we're really just beginning to do the research um, about, you know, are, are cultivated varieties of native plants as beneficial 
as sort of the wild plants that grow out in nature. And so there's still a lot more research that needs to be done on that. But, you know, there's some evidence that they're not. Because what happens is when we human beings select a trait in a plant that appeals to us for whatever reason, you know, it blooms for a really long time or the, co the color is slightly different than the wild form or the structure is different or whatever. Um, it's a dwarf variety versus, uh, you know, the normal size. Sometimes we can inadvertently remove the benefit to wildlife. So, you know, maybe we select for larger flowers that then the pollinators can't access. Um, or, you know, by selecting a dwarf variety, it has less nutritious berries on it than the wild form would have. So it's just a word of caution. What my point of view is on that is that, and this is really the message of the National Wildlife Federation too, is that stick with locally native if you can. And again, there are nurseries in the DC area that do have local native wild type plants, native plants. So, you know, definitely focus on that where you can, but also they're not as widespread as some of the cultivars. So if you are going to get a cultivar and you'll know it because it's got one of those little fancy names after the Latin name um, in parentheses on the plant tag, that means it's a cultivar. Just try to get ones that are as close to what the plant looks like in the wild as possible. Um, and I'll give a little pro tip. When I go to the nursery um, and I'm looking to add a few plants to, to my landscape, I follow the bees and the butterflies. And if you do that and, you know, you, you might see two cultivars of purple coneflower sitting next to each other in the nursery. One of them is covered in pollinators and one of them isn't. Well, I'm going to buy the one that's covered in pollinators. So, um, so just, you know, I wouldn't say, I don't think right now it's realistic to tell people only plant, you know, the local native ecotype. That would be fantastic. We're not there yet though, I don't think. And I think that choosing a cultivated variety of a native plant, a cult or a native bar is definitely a better choice than planting something non-native or not planting anything at all. So, um, so I think that's something that, you know, keep your eye on and in the coming years, hopefully we'll get more diversity in the in the availability of locally native plants and local ecotypes and more native plant specialty nurseries and things like that but in the meantime we got to work with what we got mm -hmm. and there'll be more research um coming out as to which of the native vars or native cultivars perform as well as the native straight species um versus you know not Right. And that's a great tip about following the pollinators when you go to a, a garden center. I've done the same thing at local public gardens where you, you might look at a, a bed display of, of say, different um, cone flowers, and it's very obvious which are the ones that are preferred by the pollinators. Yep. Well, thank you so much, David, for joining us on the Garden DC podcast. Um, so our listeners can find out more at the National Wildlife Federation website, nwf.org. Is there any place else that they might follow you, say, on social media? Sure, absolutely. I am all over social media. So if you can spell my name, you can find me. Um, you can look up, um, you know, naturalist David Mizajewski um, or uh, if you just go to the NWF website and type my name in, you'll, you'll, you'll get the spelling. My website is naturalist.nwf, as in National Wildlife Federation, dot org. And if you go there, all the links to all of my social media sites, my Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube channels are all there. There's also links on where you can get a copy of my book, which is called Attracting Birds, Butterflies, and Other Backyard Wildlife. It's a how-to book. You know, we'll walk you through the steps on how to do all of this and all the sales of the book go back to NWF to support our wildlife conservation program. So if you buy it, you're getting doing wildlife, you know, a double benefit there. So that's all on my website on the National Wildlife Federation page, naturalist.nwf.org. Great. And we'll put a link directly to that from the podcast episode. And I want to thank you again, David. This has been a great way to think about gardening from the wildlife perspective. Well, I appreciate the time and for helping to signal boost this message. It's really important. Plant profile, Russian sage. This woody perennial or subshrub is neither Russian nor a true sage. It is a terrific filler plant for the garden border 
with its silvery green foliage and bright violet blue flower spikes that bloom from midsummer into fall. This so-called sage is a member of the mint family, and when you brush by it, you'll notice its strong menthol odor. Russian sage requires at least six hours of sun. It prefers a lean, rocky soil, but regular garden soil is fine. It doesn't like heavy clay soil, however. It does best in garden situations with great drainage, such as along a retaining wall or curb. Russian sage is drought tolerant, deer proof, and seldom troubled by disease or pests. Pollinators love it. Bees and hummingbirds are especially attracted to the small tubular flowers that blossom in rows along its stems. Don't fertilize it. Doing so will encourage leggy growth, and this sage has a tendency to spread wide and flop a bit. So, plant it among other tall perennials for support and for an attractive contrast. Try it with ornamental grasses, tall sedums, and mums. It is best planted in the spring rather than in the fall. Leave it up in the winter as the silhouettes of the whitish stems are quite attractive. Then cut the whole plant down to the ground in March. Some commonly available cultivars to try include Blue Spire, Filigrin, Longin, and a dwarf cultivar, Little Spire. For more about Russian sage, see the fall 2010 issue of Washington Gardener magazine. Try growing Russian sage in your garden today. You can grow that. Lighting the dark. As I record this, we've just passed the end of daylight saving time and we all set our clocks back one hour. The sun is starting to set around five o'clock and many of us are going home from work in the dark. For me, this is one of the most depressing times of year. The loss of light means less time in the garden and out of doors in general. Everyone rushes to get home and cocoons inside until the days start to really lengthen again in late winter. In the past, I've contemplated wearing a miner's light on my head to get those spring blooming bulbs in. If I want to garden after the sun starts setting, I have to wave my arms around every few minutes to get my motion sensor back porch lights to stay on. Asking around, other gardeners tell me they do the same. Some have said, that they have their young children hold flashlights for them and others burn camping lanterns to weed. Still others go without light altogether and just feel their way around when raking or mulching in the dark. This last group surely likes to live a little more dangerously than I. This year, I've decided to invest in some real outdoor lighting, not just so I can get more gardening done in the dark, but also to get more enjoyment out of it. We forget that we are blessed with real seasons in our area and fall evenings can be among the most pleasant to sit outside and have a glass of wine after dinner or a cup of coffee in the morning. It's silly not to extend that day, not just to enjoy our gardens, but for the experience. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter by going to anchor.fm backslash Kathy dash gents backslash support. For as little as 99 cents a month, you can become a listener supporter and we'll give you a shout out in a future episode. Another way to support Garden DC is to go to washingtongardener.com and subscribe to Washington Gardener Magazine. You can find Washington Gardener online at washingtongardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.